Ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll begin the proceedings. And uh, thank you all for coming. It's such a cold, beautiful. You can't hear me. Okay. Is that better? Yes. yes. Okay. On such a cold, beautiful Canberra morning, um, for those of you who have come from outside Canberra, all I can say is at least the sun is shining, which is better than yesterday, but it won't be warm. Um, I'd like to begin, first I should introduce myself. I'm Jenny Corbett and I'm the director of the uh, ANU's Japan Institute. And on behalf of the co-organizers of the update, that is the, the Japan Institute and the Australia-Japan Research Center, and the co-organizer, Dr. Shiro Armstrong, I'd like to welcome you all here this morning and for the day's proceedings. Um, I'll begin with our traditional acknowledgement of the Ngunnawal people on whose traditional lands we meet, and I'd like to pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to any um, Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today. I'd like to thank our sponsors. These events uh, involve a lot of organising, but also a lot of financial and in-kind support, and I'd like to acknowledge all of the organisations that have helped us, the Australia Japan Foundation, the Japan Foundation, and the College of Asia and the Pacific at the ANU. This is our fifth Japan update. This one is on the theme of seeking new directions. We'll um, and the update is, as many of you will know, the flagship conference of the AJRC in the Crawford School of Public Policy and the Japan Institute, where we bring together experts from Australia, from Japan and from around the region to update us all and give a comprehensive overview of Japan's current economic and political landscape, and um, in particular to reflect on contemporary developments and future directions and uh, I'm sure it's in the mind of all of us that right at the moment regional developments are focusing everybody's mind very securely on current and future developments and the role that Australia and Japan will play in securing uh, the region's um, security and stability is particularly important. The update uh, the previous updates have looked at a number of different themes. Last year, we, the title was Reinventing Japan, and we were particularly looking at Japan's new directions. This year, we're carrying on in the same vein. Um, previous updates have looked at political and economic and social change, and the very first one in 2013, we titled Looking Forward in Economics, Politics and Trade. So you can see that there is a continuous theme underlying all of the updates. Um, the update will also be available on podcast for anybody who isn't able to be here and would like to see it that way, or for any of you who want to go back and look at any of the fascinating discussion that we expect. And it is also um, accompanied by a publication. The quarterly issue of the East Asia Forum is devoted to the topics that we're discussing today. And you can pick up a copy of that at the front desk if you don't have one already. Um, a couple of points before I hand over to the first panel. Uh, we, we have the foreign minister coming to uh, give a keynote address. And we have limited time for that. She's obviously on a very tight schedule. So if you would please come back from morning tea promptly when the bell rings so that we can fit in with her schedule, we'd be grateful for that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there is Wi-Fi available for anybody uh, who isn't a member of the university. And um, the Wi-Fi password is not yet on the screen, but it is available out at the front desk. and. Um, we will give you that information if you require it. Uh, the final point is that uh, when we open up for Q&A, please wait for the microphone to come round to you for your question, because it's difficult in this lecture theatre, as you've just seen, to hear without, without um, amplification. So at that point, I'd like now to hand over to the first panel. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Murray McLean to chair the first session on the Australia-Japan relationship. Um, as you will know, Murray McLean <coughs> is chair of the Australia-Japan Foundation uh, and was a senior officer of the Australia Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade 
and was uh, ambassador to Japan and, and has held a number of other important senior positions in embassies around the region. Uh, his role in Japan was uh, coincided with the initial negotiations on the um, Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement and um, of course he was there when the um, tsunami occurred and led our, our um, help to Japan to, in the recovery from that disaster. So Murray, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny, and welcome to everybody today to this uh, uh, bracing Canberra winter. It reminds me why I moved down to Melbourne, um, to enjoy four seasons in one day instead of one in one day. Um, the, uh, as, as Jenny uh, has just said, um, this is the first occasion uh, that the um, Japan update has uh, concentrated on uh, uh, at least one of the, uh, of the major panel sessions on the Australia-Japan relationship, albeit that on each of the five occasions that we've had the Japan update, there has been elements uh, related, uh, of course, directly to the relationship. Um, it's, there, it's extremely timely and appropriate that this be the case. Um, uh, because of the current developments that we're all uh, uh, closely following in North Asia, uh, with uh, obviously um, the young fellow up there uh, causing a big, a big uh, amount of um, trouble for all of us and all of the countries of the region. It does remind me of some other very, very cold bracing moments that I spent up there in North Korea in January of 2003 and four, respectively, um, sent up there as a ministerial envoy to um, try and knock some sense into them about leaving the NPT and stopping their nuclear program, and you can see how successful I was in that. Um, but, uh, the, uh, but it was freezing cold. I remember sitting in the equivalent of the Great Hall of the People there. Um, uh, with my overcoat and scarf and four or five layers on because there was no heating, uh, having the negotiations with them. Um, as the chair of the Australia Japan Foundation, I've been terribly privileged to continue in uh, a, a way to uh, contribute to the ongoing development of the Australia Japan relationship, which I um, uh, was directly involved with um, as ambassador from 2004 to 11, and um, the Australia Japan Foundation really um, is an enduring aspect or pillar of the relationship that we have because it uh, serves to ensure that Australia continues to invest in the relationship so that the depth of the relationship, which is already very significant as we all know, as well as very broad, isn't taken for granted or treated lightly. It absolutely needs ongoing investment in ideas and resources and uh, today's session will certainly contribute to that. Um, this year we've also sponsored a very successful uh, youth dialogue between Australia and Japan which um, is uh, incredibly important. We uh, need successes to the generations of um, business people, politicians and, and academics and others who have um, been so instrumental in uh, building the relationship over the last 60 years and uh, I'm delighted with the quality and standard of, of uh, these young people uh, who are very keen and enthusiastic to participate in the relationship. So I wanted uh, simply to say a few words uh, of that, of, 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 about the relationship in those, in those few remarks I've made but let me um, say today we've got um, four excellent speakers who will um, each speak about aspects of the relationship. Um, uh, Shiro Armstrong, of course, is uh, well known to everybody here uh, and has done uh, wonderful work in um, getting this whole um, Japan update um, uh, institutionalised, if I can put it that way, over the last five years. 
I've been uh, delighted with uh, everything he's done in that, in that respect and the Australia Japan Foundation of course is very pleased to have been involved in supporting uh, each of the Japan updates over the last five years. Um, Shiro um, is uh, increasingly engaged with um, uh, the international academic and research um, community and um, uh, as a, an excellent representative of the ANU and of course of Australia Japan Studies as well. Professor Ricky Curtin is a second speaker and she's Dean of the School of Arts at uh, Murdoch University and she's been also very heavily involved throughout her career, first as a diplomat and then subsequently as an academic, both here at the ANU and at various other positions in Sydney, the University of Leiden and the University of Tokyo. And she is concentrating her research into Jap Japanese history, politics and security policy and foreign policy as well. So this will be very important, I think, to hear her today. We will have, uh, we're delighted also to have Professor Fumiaki Kumo from the University of Tokyo, who's the Hepburn Professor of American Government and History of, at the Graduate Schools for Law and Politics, um, and uh, with many other distinguished uh, positions. I had the, had the uh, privilege of sitting next to him at a dinner yesterday evening, and we had a, a very lively discussion about um, ongoing developments, and I look forward very much to hearing him today. Um, Dr Llewellyn Hughes will be the um, fourth speaker and he's Associate Professor at the Crawford School of Public Policy and he will be, um, um, he, his research is principally about um, the energy markets uh, and uh, he's uh, taught at the Elliott School of International Affairs, George Washington University, Washington and uh, he's been a research uh, fellow at the Consortium of Energy Policy Research at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Uh, as well as a number of other roles. So we've got a stellar lineup of people and I, I think this will be an excellent uh, discussion. So the plan today is that we will be inviting each of the speakers to speak for up to no more than uh, 15 minutes um, so that we have some time, possibly 20 minutes at the end of that session of the speakers' presentations for Q's and A's. So without further ado, Shiro, please. Thank you very much, Murray. That was a really kind and warm introduction, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the economic relationship, the bilateral economic relationship between Australia and Japan, which I think is a, an important basis to start any discussion of the strong, deep, and broad bilateral relationship. Um, the starting point in thinking about uh, the economic relationship is a leadership from both countries that have been shown over the decades uh, and innovation that's been shown uh, in the agreements that have been signed that really kick-started the economic relationship in the post-war period. Um, this year we're celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Commerce Agreement. I have a nice banner here. Um, this was a very important agreement for Australia giving Japanese equal market access in our market, most favoured nation status in goods trade. Um, and it really helped secure energy supplies, which I'll talk about, to Japan, and raw materials supply to Japan, and helped fuel Japanese industrialization. Last year we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Nara Treaty, uh, the basic French Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation. That extended that most favored nation status treatment beyond goods trade to investment and people-to-people -people exchanges and people movement. Uh, Kickstarted a lot of things, um, including the AJF, as well as working holiday visas, and has, been, has played an important role in the bilateral relationship. Um, Australia and Japan were instrumental in the creation of APEC, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, that still endures today and is still an important venue for uh, the region's leaders to get together. It brings the President of the United States to the region each year uh, and I think is an important innovation from both countries and this couldn't have been done without the, the strong economic relationship underlying uh, the broader political relationship of the two countries. More recently, we've had the Japan-Australia Economic uh, Partnership Agreement, the EPA, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, that later. That's been the most liberalising agreement Japan has signed uh, to date. 
uh, and an important stepping stone and part of the evolution of the forward-looking, ambitious and innovative agreements that we've signed. Um, the, thanks to these, but more broadly, thanks to the, the business communities in both countries and the thickened people-to-people -people exchanges, uh, the economic relationship is, is robust and strong and growing. Um, so Japan is Australia's second largest trading partner. We have a $44 billion, US billion dollar trade relationship between the two countries. Um, and Australia is, is, is important to Japan, not just because it's third largest source of uh, imports um, and ninth largest export destination, but more importantly because of the natural resource trade and the energy supply and the raw materials. So I think a starting point for understanding the economic relationship um, is that Australia is a large and secure energy supplier to Japan. Japan relies on 94% of it, um, it imports for 94% of its energy needs uh, and Australia is by far the largest supplier um, and growing in importance. So in any energy good that matters outside of oil, we are by far the dominant supplier. Um, we're also the dominant major, economic, major supplier for strategic raw materials. 61% um, of Japan's iron ore uh, in the most recent data and over half of all other strategic raw materials. So you name it, bauxite, aluminium, aluminium, nickel, and so forth. And Japanese contracts, long-term contracts, um, were the foundation of the development for the Pilbara uh, and the natural resource industry in Australia more broadly. So I think this cannot be understated. Um, Japan relies on us as a secure and stable energy supplier. You look at the other countries here that predominantly <coughs> supply oil, um, not necessarily secure or stable, and definitely not as secure as, and stable a supplier as Australia. Um, we'll have Llewellyn talk a bit more about the energy dimension. Underlying that energy trade uh, is the strong investment relationship. Uh, and you can see here, Japan has overtaken uh, the United Kingdom as the second largest um, um, investor in Australia in terms of stock. So this is the accumulated uh, investment over time. Uh, and it shows the importance of, of Australia. So it, it's, it's fascinating. Just a couple of examples here. Um, Mitsu, the large trading company, which I'm sure you're all aware of, uh, invested $15 billion in Australia in the last decade, which is more than it's invested in North and South America combined in that time. So we're an important investment destination, and that goes to beyond just natural resources. Um, we know of other high profile investments. Um, recently, the Japan Post acquiring Toll, Toll Holdings for $6.5 billion a couple of years ago. Uh, Kidding acquiring Net Lion Nathan for $3.7 billion um, a few years before that. And then Nippon Life Insurance buying 80% of MLC for $2.5 billion. So, anecdotal evidence like that would suggest the investment relationship is diversifying. Um, it's growing in areas outside of just the natural resources. So retail, we've got Unicodal now in a few cities in Australia. Um, beverage, food and beverage, distribution, logistics, uh, insurance, finance. So it's a, it, it appears to be a, a relationship, an investment relationship that's diversifying. Yet, that doesn't really show up in the data yet. So this data is from the Bank of Japan. Um, Australian data cannot tell us um, by sector, by country. We either get aggregate by sector incoming investment or aggregate incoming investment by country. Um, luckily, the Bank of Japan has a bit of a breakdown, which I've, I've aggregated up a bit. But it still looks like mining services and production dominate this investment relationship. So I'm involved in another project tracking Chinese investment, and I want to move on to tracking Japanese investment soon. So we have a much better picture of which sectors um, Japanese investment is going to, and over time, I think we can get a, a more detailed picture of the important uh, investment relationship. Uh, but the, the bilateral economic relationship is beyond bilateral, beyond naturally bilateral, uh, nat uh, narrowly bilateral, sorry. Um, and this is nothing new, so we import a lot of Japanese goods that don't come from Japan, Japanese branded goods from Southeast Asia and China. That's been an important feature of the bilateral relationship 
um, over a long period of time. Japanese businesses use <coughs> Australia as a base um, for trade with Asia and beyond. Um, Japanese investment in Australia doesn't just ship goods back to Japan, but to China and, and elsewhere, and I think that's very important. Not to use Mitsui as another example, you might think of some favoritism here, but it was interesting how the CEO of Mitsui Australia came out during our Australia-China free trade agreement negotiations and pushed for and encouraged the, the bilateral agreement between Australia and China. And that's because they export, Mitsui exports more from Australia to China than it does back to Japan. So there was strong support for that. For that. Um, and there's also um, a lot happening already, but I think a lot more that can happen of Australia and Australian and Japanese business cooperating um, in the rest of Asia, given the closeness and the trust that's been built up um, over this long period of time. Um, and we are in a highly integrated region um, and we're both economically locked into China. So there's a lot of space for cooperation. Uh, let me move on to the bilateral free trade agreement, the EPA that was signed recently. As I mentioned, this is the most liberalizing agreement that Japan has signed to date, um, made progress with agriculture, uh, but I think there's still a little way to go. Um, you look at this chart here, it shows that we've, Japan's agreed to open up to Australian beef, um, removing tariffs that are just under 30% um, before the agreement was, uh, sorry, 40% before the agreement was signed, and over 20 years moving to just under 20%. Now that's significant compared to every other agreement Japan has signed, um, but has a, a long way to go in terms of what we've managed to do with our uh, the Northeast Asian neighbours. So China has agreed to cut to zero within 10 years and South Korea to, to zero within 15 years. So this came into force in 2015 and some nice <coughs> negotiating by our DFAT colleagues uh, meant that we got two bites of the cherry when it came into force and you can see the big drop initially, um, which I think is a, a positive sign. It's a pity it just slows down a bit. Um, some important features, there was no investor state dispute settlement mechanism in this. This is a controversial um, part of, of modern free trade agreements that um, some in the community are, are strongly against because it allows companies to sue governments outside of the domestic legal frameworks. Uh, that wasn't included in this agreement. Uh, I think the Australian uh, side and the Japanese side recognised the robustness and the independence of each other's um, um, legal system um, and, and rule of law. Um, but the initial data on the Australian agricultural exports, which are a large part of this agreement to Japan, uh, don't show an obvious kick up in, in exports. So you can see the red line here is 2014 export data and the blue one is 2016 data. Now, I'll be the first to say that you can't rely on raw numbers like this because all sorts of things move, exchange rates move, um, other countries, other agreements are signed. So we need to do a, a proper robust counterfactual to, to be able to measure the effect of the free trade agreement. So I've already thrown out a few topics there for PhD students. Um, to measure this, to get a better idea of the um, third party country economic relationship, the beyond bilateral, uh, and thinking about the investment relationship. Um, I want to, that's poorly done with the arrow, um, I want to finish off with a couple of slides on what's underdone in the relationship. I've talked about um, some of the highlights, some of the, the strengths of the, the bilateral relationship. Well, a major weakness is the lack of Australian foreign direct investment in Japan. Um, now this, I think, we heard last year from Jason Hayes from PwC who spoke at the update. For those of you who remember, he blamed both sides, which I think is a fair, fair call. Um, Japan's relatively close to foreign direct investment. That's changing recently and changing rapidly, but it's still a long way behind. Japan still ranks close to dead last, actually I think dead last in the OECD in terms of FDI stock as a ratio of um, GDP. Um, but also Australian business is very risk averse. So our Australian business investment in Asia pales in comparison to Australian investment in New Zealand, the United States, United Kingdom. And considering this is where the growth is in the world, in the global economy, Asia, I think we need to, to start to 
work on that uh, as a country generally, and we have a responsibility as a university. That's where this deep trust and understanding between the two countries, I think, is a, a great starting point for, for this. And I think this story is consistent with where both our economies are heading. So part of opening up to foreign direct investment is part of the third arrow of structural reforms of Abe's Abenomics agenda. Um, and it's also consistent with where we want to take our economy out of a, an over-reliance or heavy reliance, I shouldn't say over, heavy reliance in the natural resources industry towards a more higher value add services um, manufacturing uh, economy. Um, I'll finish very quickly on, on interest in the global economy. Um, our economic relationship was already strong. Um, it was already deep and broad before our EPA, um, partly because of the agreements we signed earlier, but those agreements afforded MFN status and really underpinned the, what was already there, which was the global system. So it was the GATT and later the WTO. And that's the framework that's that brought trade and investment in our region uh, amongst countries that didn't have um, and still don't have bilateral trade agreements. So that, that order, rules-based economic order, um, was created by the United States and underwritten by the United States um, in the whole post-war period, is now under threat from uh, an uneven uh, and slow recovery from the global financial crisis and actually, to be blunt, Trump's America. So Trump's America is a, a now a threat to this system that they created and underwrote. So I think this is a time for Australia and Japan and other open economies that rely on the global trading system to work together and form coalitions of, of open economies to really hold the line, if not push further, in liberalisation um, when we need to. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shiro, and uh, also for keeping to the time schedule. Ricky. Oh, sorry, it should be Kubel. Sorry? Well, it's just that uh, this here says Ricky. Sorry. Okay, sorry, okay. The, this, okay, sorry. Okay. Sorry, please, um, uh, 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 Fumiaki or uh, Kubo. Okay. It's a bit confusing. Uh, thank you uh, uh, very much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, inviting uh, me to uh, this very uh, important, uh, prestigious uh, event. Thank you, uh, Peter, Shiro, Jill, and uh, Ivoni. And thank you for the generous uh, introduction, Ambassador McQueen. I got uh, the invitation uh, last year, but I couldn't make it. I'm, I'm so glad that I'm finally here today. I asked uh, to talk about uh, the uh, diplomatic and security relations between Japan and Australia, which is really an exciting uh, topic, especially now when the security environment of Asia is really uh, tense. Uh, from a uh, Japanese uh, perspective, any country where cars run on the left-hand side of the street is a country of an advanced civilization. But besides, we have very uh, intimate uh, first economic relations, which Shiro elaborated upon uh, in detail. And we have more and more intimate uh, cultural and people-to-people -people exchanges uh, described in number Three, which is also very uh, impressive. We still recall that we received uh, generous help from Australians in March 2011. However, uh, we can find uh, uh, more dramatic changes uh, taking place uh, in bilateral relations in the area of uh, diplomatic and security uh, relations in the past decade especially uh, in the past five or six years. So, um, oh, this is good. Uh, I will start by uh, mentioning the Joint uh, Declaration on Security Cooperation of 2007 made uh, by Prime Minister John Howard and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Uh, it started uh, many concrete things that would help cement the trust 
between our two governments and perhaps between two uh, militaries. Uh, and, you know, many things uh, which I skip, but uh, you know, these are the basis for uh, the cooperation uh, uh, which uh, is coming uh, uh, later. And the you know, things uh, got momentum uh, since uh, 2013. Uh, there are a couple of reasons uh, for the two governments uh, to strengthen the security ties. First, uh, Shinzo Abe uh, came back to power in December uh, 2012 uh, with more assertive foreign policy agendas. Second, there's uh, also a change in power in Australia too, from a uh, Labour to Conservative coalition in 2013. Third, and most uh, importantly, the security environment was getting really tighter and more tense in this period uh, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, China's uh, infringement of Japan's uh, territorial waters uh, in the East China Sea happened first in 2008, and in 2010, there was a crash. Uh, in uh, Senkaku or Dayu area. The conflict over the islands became even more serious in 2012. Uh, the activities of China in the South China Sea, such as uh, the reclamation, the construction, and the militarization, also became a salient international issue, probably from 2014 to the present time. Japan uh, used to see this issue, the South China Sea issue, as a different one from the East China Sea problem. But nowadays, uh, in Japanese perspective, uh, they are uh, the same problem. It is an attempt uh, to change the status quo unilaterally by force. And Japan came to feel that it shares the same perspective with Australia, especially for the South China Sea. Of course, uh, needless to say, uh, North Korea is a serious problem. This is also a case of a challenge to the international community. So uh, in 2014, uh, the Special uh, Partnership for the 21st Century was declared by Abe and Abbott when uh, Abe came to Canberra. By uh, 2014, there are already a bunch of remarkable concrete outputs, such as new AXA Information Security Agreement, and the agreement concerning the transfer of the defense uh, equipment and technology. And this growing convergence was not the product of a single transaction or a pair of leaders, but converging uh, interests, which include, but are not limited to, a shared concern about a rising China as well as shared values, including democracy, the rule of law, and free uh, markets. Uh, here, uh, I would uh, like to uh, emphasize uh, Japan's uh, broadening uh, a partnership for international security cooperation. Uh, there are cases of a progress of an important magnitude and speed, uh, which uh, you know, uh, which are uh, you know, our relations with UK and Australia. Uh, Theresa May was uh, in Tokyo just uh, last week, and now between Japan and the UK, there are, there are plans for a joint exercise. And even the UK's uh, participation in the operation of the freedom of navigation by their new carrier might be uh, a possibility, and that would be a great help for the region and for Japan. And Japan and Australia are working hard uh, to help uh, the so-called uh, palm countries, uh, uh, the Pacific Island leaders are meeting. Uh, they are very important country for your uh, country and for Japan too. So uh, we see uh, here uh, Japan and Australia share the same perspective on almost all the important security issues in Indo-Pacific region, like North Korea, South China Sea, and uh, East China Sea. Uh, these are things uh, that happened uh, just two months ago or last month. And since uh, coming uh, back 
to office in late uh, 2012, uh, Prime Minister Abe achieved uh, many things that had been had been floating uh, in the Japanese politics as agendas, but had never been realized. Uh, many of them are taken for granted in other countries, but uh, Japan uh, has been uh, exceptional. Uh, uh, the politics uh, has been uh, uh, extremely uh, pacifist, and this is a partial list of his records. Uh, you can also add the TPP uh, to this list and uh, look at uh, the, the, how we are spending uh, for defense, and uh, it's still within below the 1% of the GDP, but uh, in the last five or six years, uh, it uh, increases uh, 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 pretty fast by our standard. Uh, inevitably, inevitably uh, in and outside Japan, uh, Abe has been uh, criticized uh, harshly as a dangerous uh, right-wing nationalistic leader. Uh, any small step, any minor deviation uh, from the conventional policy of Japan has been uh, viciously attacked. He also went to the Yasukuni Shrine in late 2013, which fueled, fueled anti-Abe feelings. But by the Japanese uh, standard, he's certainly a little bit more conservative and hawkish than his fellow politicians. But uh, is Japan uh, going back to the 1930s and militarism, as some would like to say? And my answer is uh, no. Uh, if, you, if you look at Japan uh, to various standards, various lenses, like the legal uh, framework, like constitution, or a lot of uh, national security legislation, or to public opinion, or actual behavior, or policies, uh, you must come to the conclusion that uh, this country must be still a uh, very and probably too much uh, pacifist uh, country. Very often, uh, foreign observers of Japanese politics and history fail to look at Japan from a meaningful comparative perspective. This is because they tend to read only writings by liberal or leftist journalists or scholars uh, in Japan. Uh, some say that uh, young stars uh, in Japan are uh, becoming uh, nationalistic. But uh, look at the uh, uh, poll uh, in this part. Oh, yeah. Willing to fight for the country? Only 11% of the Japanese said yes. And this is the lowest among 64 countries polled by Gallup in 2015. Only 11%. Probably in your case, 60% would say yes. And uh, this is a poll by the cabinet office of Japan. Will, jo are you, uh, will you join the self-defense force, the uh, Japanese uh, military, to fight if Japan is attacked? And only 6.8% 6 of Japanese say yes. And uh, you know, it's interesting that uh, you know, there's an image of the young stars of Japan are uh, more nationalistic, but uh, actually you know, senior people say more you know, in the affirmative, and young stars say just they will escape. So when Japan uh, fights, uh, it does with senior volunteers' army, which might be strong because uh, they are not afraid of dying. But uh, the point here is to what extent uh, can Japan uh, liberate itself uh, from these uh, many constraints? And it is true that Japan is uh, now uh, changing. Uh, I tend to uh, think that uh, uh, Japan has not fully uh, utilized, utilized its various potential resources for national security uh, purposes. There have been overwhelming political hurdles until recently for them to be mobilized. Here I mentioned first our defense uh, spending, uh, which is still below 1% uh, of the GDP. It's uh, about 2% in the case of Australia. It's 1.2% even with uh, New Zealand or Germany. 
and uh, our consumption tax rate is to 8%, whereas the European standard might be like 15 to 20 or even 22 or 3%. And our space policy might be what uh, I'm mentioning because it has undergone a pretty radical change from pure uh, scientific uh, research to a more national security oriented uh, program. Uh, it uh, the change took place in early uh, 2000. Now Japan uh, incorporates uh, its space policy as an essential part of national security uh, strategy. And as is the case of uh, 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 submarines, we sometimes have uh, good uh, technological capabilities. In the case of uh, this uh, quasi uh, satellite, uh, quasi zenith satellite, uh, might be uh, interesting for Japan and Australia. Uh, because uh, they cover Japan and uh, Australia you know, uh, at the same time, and uh, they will make up for the weak spots of the GPS by the United States. Uh, this has a resilience, uh, resilience aspect as well as a deterrence, deterrence function, because if any country destroys the US system, there's still Japan's uh, system uh, in place uh, in, you know, certain part of the world. And uh, uh, it says, I, I misspelled it, uh, you know, fourth uh, satellite will be coming not in 2018, but actually uh, next month, October 10th. So you know, things are moving pretty fast. Uh, after all, but you know, it is uh, important to remember that it's up to the leadership of the Japanese politics, whether Japan can fully uh, mobilize its resources. And we, Japan and Australia, naturally share many concerns ahead. Uh, how to confront North Korea and China would be chronic problems. How to forge a united front against China is uh, another difficult issue. You know, almost every country is economically interdependent with China, and inherently related with this problem is a problem of to what extent a country can get tough with China in security areas, given the large degree of economic interdependence. And the new problem might be uh, the, the United States. For the short term, allies have to detect true intentions of the Trump administration in the deluge of President's impulsive tweets. For the long term, we have to be prepared for the United States to be even more uh, inward uh, looking in the coming years. And still, the most serious uh, you know, concerns might be from Japan's uh, domestic politics, which is still very or too much pacifist. Abe's uh, approval ratings became weaker in the last few months, though uh, we saw some turnaround uh, last month. Uh, in uh, closing, you know, I would like to uh, say this. Uh, what if uh, there is uh, no Australia for Japan, you know? Uh, if uh, there is no continent or you know, uh, this place is inhabited by totally different people, what if there is no, no Australia? Of course, uh, definitely, you, uh, Japan will lose a crucially important partner who could uh, you know, uh, stand up uh, with Japan for the rule of law, you know, for the maintenance of the current international order. Then, I have to ask you, what if uh, there is no Japan? Of course, uh, definitely you will lose a big customer for your natural resources. You also lose a good place for skiing with quality food and uh, hot springs. But hopefully, you, know, uh, you might feel that uh, you lost a potentially, potentially powerful uh, partner who would stand up to to maintain the current international order based on democratic values and mutual trust. My sense is that we share so many interests and our bilateral relations are now uh, so mature and deep that we can make our relations even more solid 
than ever before. There is a reason, I guess, for our strategic partnership to be called uh, special, which also suggests a new direction, new direction, which is the major theme of this year's uh, Japan update. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Kubal. That was a very entertaining and very instructive um, uh, uh, speech. Can I ask Professor Ricky Kirsten now to speak? Yesterday, when I called my office in Perth, they told me I sounded like the female Darth Vader. <laughs> I'd like to give you apologies in advance. I am a recovering person from laryngitis. I think I can last 15 minutes. Let's see how we go. So today, I'd like to talk about um, especially the Australia-Japan security relationship, uh, with a particular focus on how uh, the uh, Japanese bid for the future submarine in Australia, the Sordu submarine bid, uh, what this showed us about underlying assumptions that each nation has of the other. Um, I am not arguing here that the um, failure of the Saudi bid uh, seriously destabilised the bilateral relationship. I think it did not. But what it did do was reveal these underlying assumptions that we have of each other. And I think we need to take that into account as we address future issues that arise to challenge the relationship. <coughs> Now, there seems to be a picture missing from there. Oh, so it's oh, I'm I didn't do that. So, I would say, I know disruption is a very trendy term, but I think the Australia-Japan relationship is currently facing a degree of disruption, or at least a jolt, uh, a catalyst to reconsider what we have been assuming since 2007. In other words, since the signing of the Joint Declaration, we've been on a steady trajectory of institutionalisation and trust building um, with a strong focus on practical cooperation between the two countries, right through um, to the present. And I see no reason why uh, this would not continue. But as I said earlier, the um, Saudi submarine bid was fascinating to me because the <coughs> discussions that took place in both countries, in, um, especially in Japanese parliament, in the uh, more informed uh, media outlets in both countries, um, and even within the bureaucracies in both countries, um, showed us uh, what we were um, projecting onto the relationship and in large part the Saudi bid's failure has caused us uh, to question those assumptions and I will go into more detail about those assumptions later. The key thing is when we were considering purchasing the Saudi submarine it was a catalyst for a debate about whether <coughs> this would make an alliance relationship between Japan and Australia desirable or unavoidable or even necessary. So um, that is a significant upgrade to the current um, security partnership that exists between the two countries. And it's this uh, word alliance uh, that triggered um, what I can only describe as great dissonance in perspective between Japanese views of the bilateral security relationship 
and Australian views of the bilateral relationship. So even though the relationship remains um, steady and strong, there was a bit of a jolt saying, hey, maybe we don't see things the same way after all. And um, two other elements uh, that I think are interrelated are the advent of the Trump administration, <coughs> particularly significant to Australia-Japan's security relations, because as much of the literature argues, it's the trilateral logic underpinning the bilateral relationship that makes that bilateral relationship matter in security terms. So if the Trump administration is taking a new direction, a new emphasis, or even if we can say that the liberal international order may be looking slightly less liberal, this is going to affect where we position the bilateral security relationship. And Abe also needs to be taken into account because he's experiencing quite a jolt domestically at the moment. Successive scandals have weakened his domestic political base and even within his own political party. And I think it's quite possible um, in this context of a DPRK nuclear threat that Abe will look to Australia for concerted um, statements of support, if not action, of, that represent a demonstration of support for Japan. There's an increased desperation and need on the part of Abe. So I think these are the three things that we might argue are disrupting that nice steady trajectory that we've been having since 2007. <coughs> now the trilateral logic behind the bilateral <coughs> relationship, it's, it's pretty self-evident. Um, you'll see over and over in, in the literature, Japanese and Australian analysts saying that the Australia-Japan relationship is the most developed security relationship that each nation has with any other apart from the US. That's how developed this security relationship has become. There's also a strong commitment on the part of Australia and Japan to um, step up, to use the terminology, to become fully capable, fully interoperable members of the US alliance system. And an enhanced bilateral relationship is a strong demonstration of that commitment. Australia and Japan want to keep the US engaged in Asia. And at the same time, an enhanced bilateral security relationship between Australia and Japan is a hedge against a possibility that the US may be less engaged in Asia Pacific in the future. So you know, <coughs> the argument is it's the US that makes Australia, Japan security relations matter. And that's why we need to constantly scrutinize whether the direction being taken by the Trump administration <coughs> might derail or alter the perspective that both nations bring to this very positive security relationship. <coughs> there is a bilateral logic to the Australia-Japan security relationship. Um, these are just some key words that demonstrate that. We facilitate each other's um, contributions uh, globally and regionally, whether it be the East Asia Summit or the UN Security Council, we are each other's best advocate. Uh, there's complementarity in policy terms, particularly noticeable is the capacity building efforts in the security realm in Southeast Asia. Australia and Japan are working in a complementary manner to enhance individual Southeast Asian nations' capabilities in their um, current threat environment in a very effective way. I've already discussed interoperability. That is enhancing military exercises between Australia and Japan have increased dramatically in number. And with the AXA, as Kubo Sensei um, pointed out, the uh, revision of the AXA, this is only going to increase and become more meaningful. <coughs> you can argue there's a real public good attached to this bilateral security relationship. 
and that's um, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, uh, it's peacekeeping. But that's non-traditional security. And if we return to this question of the Saudi of submarine bit, what was different about that issue was that it confronted policymakers in both countries <coughs> with the prospect of moving more decisively into the realm of traditional security cooperation. And that's the big deal about this, this matter. Minilateralism, we've seen it in nuclear non-proliferation, um, in climate change. So really, the bilateral dimension, the benefits, the dividends of the bilateral relationship are also global and regional in nature. It's not just entirely dependent on whether the US approves or is involved, um, for example, in the trilateral strategic dialogue. <coughs> so when we talk about the submarine, we know um, so confident were uh, the Japanese in the early stages of this process between 2014 and 2016 that um, in Japanese bureaucratic circles it became known as the Goryu bid rather than the Soryu bid. So the Australian Dragon uh, was the name of the project in the Ministry of Defence. And on both sides, many people assumed that Australia purchasing Japanese submarines was the logical next step in this trajectory that had been so impressive since 2007. It didn't seem odd to many people at all, it seemed logical. <coughs> It reaffirmed um, how both nations regarded their role in the US alliance. But crucially here, the, the political benefit to the Abe administration um, really was attached to this bid. Um, it would promise to rejuvenate the um, defence export industry of Japan in a tangible way. Uh, that was not directly associated with the uh, US alliance that um, Japan has. So it was stepping away, in, 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 a, in a manner of speaking, it was a, a little bit more of independence stepping away from Japan-US tight embrace, a bit more of independent action. Um, the hard edge uh, that would be attached to this kind of major um, defence acquisition in Australia was very significant to Japanese commentators and analysts. It did signify uh, a significant transition towards um, hard security as opposed to soft or traditional as opposed to non-traditional. And uh, politically, domestically, Australia <coughs> being um, the partner for such a major acquisition that would last 30 years in duration would be, it would provide great affirmation to the proactive pacifism policy of um, the Abe administration. So if I talk about the assumptions, <coughs> it's not going to let me do that. Oh yes, there we go. So Australia had certain assumptions about Japan that an empowered and capable Japan is essential to regional stability, that a normal Japan uh, would be important in a multipolar Asia, but clearly Japan would expect Australia to choose sides when it comes to China. There was also an idea that um, in the view of third parties, Australia working in partnership with Japan would moderate Japan's behaviour. And because Australia is not the US, it lends this positive patina to that <coughs> development. But it was very clear in Australian commentary that the prospect of the Saudi bid being successful would, to quote Hugh White, lock Australia into an alliance with Japan for 30 years and that this was completely unthinkable and undesirable. Australian commentary turned against the prospect of an alliance with Japan, and this was the context in which the Saudi bid um, 
was unsuccess unsuccessful. It's not the reason, it's the context within which that happened. So there was an entrapment fear. And in terms of what Japanese thought of Australia, um, commentary in Japan was awash with uh, quasi-ally um, language. Australia's already a quasi-ally. Um, why wouldn't they choose us? There was an assumption that the US would force Australia for strategic reasons and alliance reasons to choose Saudi, that it would have nothing to do with cost or, or Australia's needs or operability. It was uh, Australia would fold. Uh, there was that expectation. And Japan did assume that Australia could get too close to China and Japan could perform a valuable role of preventing Australia getting too close to China. But the real crunch was that in parliamentary debates in Japan and in analysis, there was a strong view that Australia could not be trusted with the jewel in the crown technology of the sword U submarine. And that if it was going to proceed, it would have to be a black box build or a spec down bid very clear line of argument in Japan. And there was a political argument running counter to that following the lack of success of the bid, that in not choosing Sordhu, Australia was effectively saying that it did not support Japan's China policy. And I can elaborate on that. And my final slide, Murray. <coughs> my voice is holding out. So I'm not saying the Saudi bid's failure um, destroyed the relationship. It didn't, but it did disrupt it. We're going to see continued um, build-up in military exercises of increased pace and frequency between Australia and Japan. But we must remember that Prime Minister Abe burnt considerable political capital, getting Japan to a point in a legislative sense where the Saudi bid had it been successful, would have had a proper political context. The dissonant views that were exposed, um, I think, are significant and bear scrutiny from all of us who favour this strong security relationship. And I want to point in particular to the reciprocity gap. In Japanese commentary on the failure of the Saudi bit, um, there was a line of expectation revealed that I think emanates from the July 2014 cabinet resolution on collective self-defense, that Japan would come to the aid of countries in a close relationship with Japan. Australia was frequently mentioned in parliamentary debates as such a country. I think there already exists an expectation of reciprocity on Japan's part from Australia and that there is not yet that degree of reciprocity existent in Australia about Japan coming to its aid. I think this is significant. And finally, to end with um, the Trump administration, if the liberal international order is going to become less liberal, what does this mean for the rhetoric and the logic and the impulse behind Australia-Japan security relations? It's all about liberal internationalism, open markets, free trade, rule of law. We see it in all of the documentations. It's not just rhetoric, is it? But this is the context we currently face. And I leave you with that question and thank you for listening to the female Darth Vader. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ricky. That's a very thought-provoking presentation. Can I now ask Professor uh, Llewellyn Hughes to uh, speak? So uh, I feel like I should do this presentation um, with a faux Darth Vader voice, just to continue with the uh, continue with the gag from. Um, the last presentation. Um, 
I've been asked to speak a little bit uh, to give you an update of uh, what's going on in Japan's energy picture and the relationship between Australia and Japan. But let me first uh, begin by uh, echoing Murray McLean's uh, comment about the uh, the US, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Australia-Japan Youth Dialogue, um, which has recently been put together. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, to meet with uh, group, that group, and it's really a terrific uh, group uh, of people across um, different sectors of Australia, both the private sector um, and also within government and elsewhere, um, who had the opportunity uh, to talk um, to talk over uh, key issues in Japan and uh, Australia and Japan's relationship. I was only somewhat wistful because uh, it's, uh, I've obviously uh, clearly graduated from the um, from being on the other side of the fence to one uh, to, uh, on, uh, uh, doing the presenting. Um, the other point I wanted to make, uh, just to begin, uh, was to note that uh, a second initiative um, uh, has recently uh, been put in place that helps strengthen the Australian and Japanese relationship. Uh, that is a new double degree uh, that exists, uh, has been uh, newly created between uh, the Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo and the Crawford School of Public Policy at the ANU. It enables you to spend a year in each country, complete classes at both institutions and, and receive uh, a master's of public policy um, from both institutions. So it's really a new initiative which has begun this year. If you um, ha are interested in doing an MPP, if you um, have friends who might be interested in doing an MPP, I would encourage you to take a look uh, at the potential of that, of that opportunity. Okay, um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, the, the, energy, uh, the energy space. So um, as Shiro uh, pointed out uh, earlier, um, it's really difficult to begin uh, a conversation uh, about Australia-Japan energy relations without starting uh, in terms of uh, trade and investment in the natural resources sector. Um, Shiro has already made this point, so I don't want to spend a lot of time in it, but Australia really is a, a key supplier uh, uh, of, of uh, mineral resources, of which obviously energy is extraordinarily important. Um, and that is focused uh, particularly within natural gas, as LNG, and uh, also within, uh, within coal, uh, oil less so, but that's partly because Australia doesn't uh, export a lot of uh, oil. In fact, we import quite a lot of oil and products. Um, the, the second part of it, though, and I think this is, this is uh, an interesting part in terms of the nature of the relationship, uh, focuses on investment. So, uh, Japan doesn't matter only to Australia and vice versa because of, of, of trade uh, in these products. But uh, inward foreign direct investment from Japanese companies into Australian uh, uh, resource, uh, energy related uh, resources is really uh, large. The, the, the graph that you can see behind, uh, behind me uh, focuses on the Japanese trading companies and their investments within Japan. But I also want to focus on the role of INPEX and also uh, JOGMEC, the Japan Oil, Gas and Minerals National Corporation. So JOGMEC uh, is, a, is a financer uh, both of exploration work and also uh, of development projects and, uh, and provides financing to a number of these companies as they develop uh, projects within Australia and elsewhere around the world. And they're tightly tied to the national goal of Japan's energy policy, which is about diversification of supply uh, and also diversification of fuels. Uh, INPEX uh, is owned uh, partially by uh, the Japanese government, uh, just over 18% of its outstanding shares as well as a golden share are owned or, or retained by the Minister uh, for Economy, uh, Trade and Industry. And so you can think about INPEX as a, as a quasi-national oil company in Japan. And uh, INPEX is also uh, significantly uh, invested in Aus Australia as well. It's invested uh, as an operator um, in Western Australia uh, for, um, for the ICTHIS uh, project. Um, it's invested uh, in Darwin, and it's also uh, invested uh, in the floating LNG project, which is being developed and operated by Shell. So I think that these kinds of initiatives uh, and the fact that INPEX and JOGMEC are heavily involved in them really underlines how important Australia is as part of Japan's broad uh, strategic energy policy in and around natural, natural resources. It's not only uh, about trade, but it's also about that core role in diversification that, that, uh, that, Japan, uh, that Australia is able to provide. Now, in the spirit of today's, uh, the theme for today, which is uh, seeking new directions, uh, we have uh, a panel on innovation uh, later, um, I wanted to spend uh, most of my time uh, talking about what opportunities might exist beyond this. Uh, the, Resource projects I showed you, you know, 20, 30 year projects, um, you know, that relationship will continue, uh, you know, off into the future um, and it's, it's fairly predictable. But I, I want to, you know, argue that, that, that um, Australia and Japan actually have a lot of shared interests outside of the resource sector in the energy space. 
Okay, um, and that comes from uh, I think a, a couple of different a couple of different areas. The first of those is that both uh, Australia, Australian governments, both uh, the federal government and its, at the state level, and the Japanese government are wrestling with very similar problems, particularly in the in the electricity sector. So what you can see here is slightly uh, outdated uh, figures, and I apologise for not updating you. I can promise you the line keeps going up. Um, uh, showing you the installed base uh, of renewable uh, energy production uh, in Japan. In 2012, Japan uh, mirrored uh, Germany in introducing a feed-in tariff, and it's had uh, a pretty extraordinary effect on increasing installed capacity of renewable energy uh, within Japan. Um, you can see that here, uh, and, and this is broken down um, by renewables, uh, renewables itself. If you look at that in terawatt hours, that is how much electricity is actually being generated uh, within Japan using renewables, uh, that, that picture is shown uh, for you here. You can see renewables at the bottom. That looks small, okay? But um, remember, this has started from a very small base. And you can also think about, uh, for example, in the fourth quarter of 2016, uh, renewable production in Japan uh, reaching uh, almost half as much as thermal coal uh, in, in its role in generating electricity for, for the Japanese, uh, Japanese industry, for households, and for the commercial, uh, commercial sector. Now, um, like Australia, uh, which has seen you know, significant falls in system prices for renewable uh, energy, uh, that has meant that today the Japanese government is having to deal with a whole range of what I like to call secondary issues around integrating uh, renewable energy with the, with the electricity grid. Um, to give you an idea of, of just, a, just a few, of, uh, a couple of those, uh, you can see here uh, a picture of, uh, on your, on, on your um, left, I guess, uh, of, of the uh, wind power uh, uh, sites which have been developed in Japan. Actually, one of the funny things about uh, Japan's renewable energy sector is it's heavily uh, weighted towards solar photovoltaics at the moment, and the government is interested in, in pushing wind pretty significantly. Um, and you can see the wind pr uh, power projects here. Uh, the problem, of course, is if you look on your, on your right here, is you can see what Japan's uh, el uh, electricity grid looks like. Much like uh, Australia, uh, Japan's electricity grid uh, was really determined by the service areas of its power utilities, and that meant, means that there are significant constraints between uh, each of those service areas that the utilities used to provide, which makes it very difficult uh, managing the incorporation of renewable uh, energy into Japan's electricity grid. That should sound familiar to you uh, if you've been following what's been going on in South Australia and, uh, and, and Australia's energy, uh, energy debate as well. And the regulators in Japan are going through a whole range of di different discussions, much as we are here, about what to do about that. So Hokkaido Electric uh, has run a three-year pilot program which has looked into how effective battery, grid-side battery storage is, for example, in managing intermittency issues uh, that you find with the incorporation of wind power into Japan's electricity grid. That should sound familiar to you if you've been keeping up with Elon Musk's uh, recent, uh, recent announcements um, about, uh, about battery storage in, 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 in Australia. Um, this, uh, this, this just shows you another uh, uh, area um, in, in which uh, the, Japanese, the Japanese government is dealing with. Uh, up until now, if you wanted to plug a renewable energy project into the grid in Japan, you negotiated with uh, the, the utility about the costs and the location of connection. And so the government is trying to lower the cost for renewable uh, energy developers, in fact, all new uh, energy developers, uh, by introducing a tendering scheme so that multiple companies can bid in in order to share the costs associated with inter interconnection to the electricity grid. So there's a lot of kind of uh, regulatory uh, innovation which is going on associated with this transition to a less carbon intensive electricity grid, which Japanese regulators are dealing with, and which our Australian regulators are, uh, are dealing with uh, as well. And I'm a, you know, a, a, a student of uh, comparative public policy. I believe that lesson learning uh, is an important thing that uh, governments can engage in with one another. And it strikes me there's an opportunity there to have a conversation around those kinds of issues, which are a, a shared, a shared issues for both, both governments. The, the second uh, problem that, that, that uh, the Japanese government uh, is dealing with uh, in, in terms of renewable integration is household costs. Uh, so, um, and, and, and also, as I said, uh, shifting uh, the, the, the ratio uh, of, of, uh, of solar photovoltaics as a part of all of the renewables introduced in Japan to try and promote wind, 
biomass geothermal other sources of power. This shows you their feed-in tariff rates that were announced, uh, or beca became operative, I should say, on uh, the 1st of uh, April 2017. And they've done a number of different things to try and make particularly wind uh, more attractive to uh, foreign direct investment. In fact, um, there are quite a number of foreign uh, firms, which are non-Japanese firms, which are invested in the wind power sector in Japan today, which have seen these kinds of changes and are interested in taking advantage of them. And I, I, I'd like to see Australian <coughs> companies do that too. Um, you know, they've, what they've done here and what this is showing you uh, is, is that particularly for wind projects, uh, for, for, um, for others as well, biomass and geothermal, that the feed-in tariff rate has been locked in for three years. Now, the development of wind takes quite a bit longer than solar, partly because of the uh, environmental assessment process. Uh, and so, but, but this is a key way in which the government's trying to provide certainty on returns to uh, companies which are investing in, uh, in wind and, and uh, in geothermal and, uh, in, uh, and in biomass um, as, as well. So there's kind of a lot going on here, and there, you know, there's, there's really a lot of investment and excitement about these about these changes that are that are, that are happening. Uh, the, I would be remiss without talking about Japan's stellar role uh, that it has played in helping push technology uh, that is decarbonizing the transport sector. So. Um, uh, you know, this is something that really Australia is quite far behind on relative to many other OECD countries. What you can see here is the number of uh, fast charging stations uh, in Japan. That is, they're charging uh, to about 80% of a Nissan Leaf's battery charge in 15 to 20 minutes. And it's called Chademo. Uh, the reason it's chademo is a, is a play on words because you can ocha, ocha demo no mimasuka uh, as you're waiting for your Nissan Leaf to charge for 15 minutes at the, uh, at the uh, charging station. Uh, so, you know, I mean, Australia, I, I saw Josh Feidenberg uh, talk last week in Melbourne who was talking about the, the, the EVs were a, a likely future part of uh, Australia's energy picture. And it strikes me that Japan has a tremendous amount of expertise, uh, both in a regulatory sense and a technical sense, in and around uh, electric vehicles which, and fuel cell vehicles as well, which could be shared um, both at the government level but also at the private sector level between, uh, between the two countries. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, so the, the, I thought I should finish uh, with, it, with a couple of different things. Um, firstly, to, make, uh, to, to let you know what to, what to look out for. So as I said, this is a moving picture, just as you see in Australia. Uh, the government in Japan uh, has problems, like the Australian government, in providing certainty over time. Uh, in Japan, of course, that's because of the nuclear restarts issue, which you'll notice I haven't talked about. Um, uh, and, and, and what the government is doing right now is going through a process uh, within the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry of thinking about what the targets for 2030 and importantly actually the targets for 2050 should be in terms of the share of different fuels within Japan's electricity sector. Now, the government has quite a bullish view on the role of nuclear. Uh, you can see here, I think, 22 to 24 percent of generated electricity in 2030. But there's a lot of analysis out there that suggests that that's an overly ambitious target. And so the question becomes, what role will gas play? Uh, for Australia, particularly, what role will gas play? And what role will renewables play in making up any potential shortfall uh, from the uh, from uh, from uh, the, the, lack of, um, the, the lack of nuclear power. Um, I expect uh, that by the end of this financial year that uh, the government will have uh, made some announcements around this because it's part of what's called the basic energy strategy. Uh, let me finish um, by, by making uh, a point about uh, another initiative that I'm, that I'm involved in. Uh, some of you may have seen that uh, Prime Minister Turnbull uh, in Germany recently announced uh, an, energy, uh, an energy hub uh, the Australia-German uh, Energy Hub, which uh, is an initiative which the ANU and the University of Melbourne are jointly managing on the Australian side, and it has support from the Department of Foreign Affairs and, Tra and Trade and elsewhere. And the idea of that hub is to talk about shared issues within the energy space. Okay, what is it that the German government and the Australian government are dealing with together as you think about decarbonisation uh, and, and innovation and other kinds of issues. And it's quite an exciting five-year project. I'm really you know, looking forward to participating in that. Um, and, but, but my point is that I feel that Japan and Australia could be doing that too. That there are a, a lot of shared regulatory issues that the two countries are facing. There are also, I think, opportunities for the kinds of investment that Shiro you know, talked about wanting to understand more about, that is on a sectoral country basis, 
what kind of investment is coming from Australia into Japan and vice versa already outside the natural resources sector in energy? And what more could be done to help facilitate that as governments, as track to, as academics, uh, and also as the business community? So I'll stop there and thanks for your time. Well, thank you very much, Llewellyn. Could I ask the panellists, please, the speakers, to take their seats uh, here, at the, here at the table? I'll stand up. And um, we've got um, a bit over 10 minutes uh, uh, for questions and answers, and I can see many hands up already. So, um, Dr Evans here. Please uh, announce your name and your affiliation as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bronwyn Evans, a CEO of Standards Australia and member of the Australia Japan Foundation. This question is for Dr Armstrong. I was struck in your presentation when you talked a lot about business, but one of, there's been a lot of discussion in Australia about the importance of business leaders having Asian literacy. And I wanted to just very specifically target Japanese literacy in Japan for, for business leaders in Australia. What are those essential elements and how indeed do we develop them? Sure, well that's a, if I can take a question, yeah, a, a great question. And I think, um, you know, to be honest, the, the agenda that we need to follow was laid out pretty clearly in the Australia in the Asian Century white paper. That wasn't just for Japan, but that, that can tell us what we need to do. It, <coughs> language training is a start, um, especially in a country like Japan, um, given the lack of English compared to a lot of other countries in our region. Uh, but beyond that, it's spending time in country. We have a lot of that, but there's still this hesitation to to really invest and put our money where our, our mouth is in, in Japan. So in-country experience and deeper understanding and knowledge of the country, I think. Thank you. <coughs> sure. Yes. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, Liu Tuo from the Taiwan Mission. Uh, this question is uh, for uh, Professor Kubo and Professor Kirsten. Uh, could you please comment uh, on the possible actions of uh, Japan and Australia uh, in the case of uh, the military conflict in the peninsula, uh, Korean Peninsula, especially in light of uh, some different opinions uh, over the military uh, involvement in these countries. Thank you. Professor Kubo? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very important but very difficult uh, question. Uh, and uh, the answers uh, would uh, depend on what kind of uh, military you know, confrontation you know, uh, happens uh, in the Korean Peninsula. That would be a uh, you know, large scale normal type of war or uh, it's a, a preemptive attack by the United States. So, you know. Uh, the Japanese response uh, would uh, depend on uh, that kind of uh, phenomena things. But uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, Japan now has uh, security legislation that would uh, uh, make it possible for the, the government to uh, dispatch uh, the Japan's uh, self-defense forces uh, to uh, fight alongside with the United States. So uh, this would be a great help, at least uh, for uh, the United States military. But uh, you know, in a very uh, indirect way, still, but that, would, that should be a help for the South Korean government too. And of course, that would be a, a great help to the Japanese government uh, itself. Uh, and uh, you know, for now, you know, Japan is talking about uh, having. Uh, you know, a little bit more uh, missile, anti-missile capabilities, like uh, uh, introducing uh, so-called Aegis ashore, you know, uh, or uh, having, uh, there's an ongoing discussion whether Japan should have a counter-strike capability, uh, which is still pretty controversial in Japan. Thank you. Thank you. Ricky? <coughs> I think this is where we might, uh, for the first time, see what the real consequences are of the um, 
weak uh, link, if you like, in the US alliance system between Japan and South Korea. This is where it really might finally um, become um, very evident to South Korean and Japanese leaders, regardless of any other issue, that a strong security relationship between these two countries is absolutely essential. And we do not have that uh, right now. I think that's, that's a concern. Um, ultimately, the US is key. What the US does, I think, will determine largely, not exclusively, um, how Australia and Japan might respond. If there is a coordinated response, it's going to be, I think, effective, given how much practice um, Japanese and Australian forces have had, um, albeit in uh, non-traditional settings, uh, disaster relief, uh, peacekeeping, etc. Um, still, there have been a lot of examples of effective um, coordination, and I would expect to see eff effective coordination. Um, and I would expect that to be more of a rear guard, even an intelligence based one, uh, rather than a frontline uh, troop commitment one, because I think this conflict is not going to be clean. Um, the other issue, uh, and of course um, North Korea is depending on this, uh, we might find out for the first time whether the missile intercept system, as uh, Kubo Sensei said, currently um, sea-based, maritime-based um, in Japan, not land-based, we're going to find out possibly whether it actually works or not. And the demonstration effect um, will be huge, whether it does work or whether it doesn't work. Thank you. <coughs> uh, hello, my name's uh, Cameron Noble from the Japan section at DFAT. I have a question for Dr. Hughes. Um, in your presentation, you, you talked about the, the emerging energy mix in Japan, but I'm just wondering where hydrogen fits in that, because um, we had a visit by a Japanese parliamentarian a couple of weeks ago, and she's uh, the chairperson of a building a hydrogen society <coughs> within the LDP. And Japan has labelled the Olympics as the hydrogen Olympics. Um, you know, Toyota and Honda developing the hydrogen fuel cell cars. And they're going to be rolled out even in Australia in, in the 2020s. A lot of research happening even at ANU, at the School of Engineering here. Um, so there's a lot of energy being put into that. Um, <coughs> and obviously Australia has a lot of potential to, to make that a new source of income with the brown coal, um, even uh, you know, it can't be, the brown coal can't be used that it has been traditionally, but there's opportunities there to convert that brown coal into hydrogen using new technology. So I'm just wondering how you see that. And also, um, <coughs> currently, obviously, at the beginning of your presentation, you, you showed how much Australia is exporting to Japan in terms of uh, coal and LNG. I'm just wondering how how Japan's changing energy mix will change um, Australia's contribution to that new energy mix and what are the opportunities there for Australia uh, to contribute to that? Thank you. Greg, uh, thanks for the question. So hydrogen is really interesting and I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm excited you asked the question because um, you know, I think it's one of you know, perhaps a, a basket of potential issues over which um, you know, a uh, a deeper understanding of what the opportunities might be, uh, where they uh, where they lie. So, um, uh, if you the key area and with, within or area within which hydrogen uh, has been uh, proposed to play a significant role uh, is within the transport sector, and there are some areas within in, in which. Um, th that, that competes with alternative technologies. So uh, particularly with battery electric vehicles and lithium ion batteries, uh, obviously a large market share of that is held by Panasonic and that particular technology uh, is pushed by Mitsubishi, by Nissan and uh, by Honda as well, which is kind of having a bet each way. Uh, on fuel cells, 
um, uh, the uh, Toyota is really, uh, you know, the, the strongest backer of fuel cells. In fact, Toyota uh, is, you know, has invested in battery electric vehicles. But I just read the CEO, <coughs> Toyota CEO uh, saying yesterday once again um, that he did not see uh, a long-term future for transport in, in, in lithium-ion uh, technologies because he doesn't think that batteries are going to be able to progress as fast as people expect, and that uh, fuel cells uh, will be the alternative. So, um, you know, there are other areas as well, right? So, um, you know, in other areas of transport, uh, in trucking, uh, for example, long distance uh, transport uh, in which batteries might not get the job done, uh, you know, fuel cells can play a role and hydrogen can play a role in that. Um, and, uh, and also within, within households themselves. And I think in households as well, you see kind of competing technologies uh, with, you know, uh, some of the big uh, Hitachi and other companies developing <coughs> energy management systems which are built around the lithium ion battery and electric vehicles, but you see competing technologies which would also be reliant on hydrogen. So, uh, you know, I think you know, to, to round that off, uh, I would say that the, that, um, that the picture is not yet clear, that there are industrial consortiums which are on, on the sides of different technologies. But hydrogen has uh, a significant, uh, as, as you noted, uh, there's a significant segment of Japanese industry and also <coughs> within parliament which are supportive of the idea of a, a hydrogen society moving, uh, moving forward. And that would obviously be a potential opportunity for, uh, for, for, um, for uh, Australia. In terms of the changing energy mix, so, um, you know, the big question I think uh, is, uh, is uh, you know, revolves around nuclear restarts. Um, uh, in terms of Australia's short-term interests, um, to the extent that nuclear plants are not restarted, they need to be replaced by something. There are something like 42 units which have been uh, of, of coal, thermal coal which have been announced uh, by Japanese IPPs and by Japanese utilities. And, um, you know, uh, analysts differ on, the, on, on whether those are likely to be built or not. Um, but if it's not coal, then, you know, it's li likely to be uh, some mix of gas and renewables. And, you know, from a climate perspective, that would be my preference, obviously. Um, and, you know, I think that provides, uh, obviously, opportunities uh, for, Australia, uh, for Australia as well. And there are a lot of changes in gas markets that help, help that happen with flexibility around uh, contracts um, in, in gas markets, which enable, uh, you know, more uh, shifts in volumes associated with those contracts. And that's something that, you know, Australia will be part of as the Asia-Pacific gas market changes. Thank you very much. There's a question here. Peter, yeah. <coughs> we might have to make this the last question. A uh, question for Llewellyn and, uh, and Shiro, but let me just uh, congratulate the four panellists on what has been, I think, a tremendously substantial and thoughtful uh, contribution that they've made to the discussion. Um, you know, we've got our own self-made energy crisis here, uh, and. Uh, uh, in view of the nature of the energy interdependence between Australia and Japan that Shiro and Llewellyn have described and the huge transformation that's taking place in the energy scene in Japan and across the region in China and, and elsewhere, uh, do, you, do you see value now uh, in, uh, in initiating a substantial high level, I mean leaders level dialogue on uh, energy transformation, uh, that is Australia and Japan initiating such a dialogue in the region? Let me have a, a quick go and then Llewellyn can answer it. I, I <coughs> suspect you have an answer to that question yourself, Peter. Um, but I, I think, you know, that is why we matter in Northeast Asia when it comes down to it. It's, it's our security of <coughs> supply uh, and how important that is for political security in Northeast Asia. When we have our own crisis here and we intervene in the market, um, it never works out well for anyone when we intervene in the market and we can get severely punished and, and undercut our own security of supply. So as we in Australia as well as in Northeast Asia and elsewhere go through these very big changes in, in energy mix, um, I think it is important to have dialogues at all levels, including at the, at the leadership level. So there's a bit more forward planning and signalling um, and cooperation around these issues. Quick, uh, quick response from Will, and I will ask one more question. Sure. So I think that the, you know, 
Is there an opportunity to have deeper dialogue? Yes. Uh, you know, the question um, around timing of, of when to do that and at what level to do that is an interesting one. So often when I, you know, think about the, the energy climate relationship, for example, and, you know, the United States is another, you know, a case here where energy <laughs> debate is highly politicized, that there are ways that you can uh, engage in dialogue um, which, you know, don't push the buttons that lead to politicization of the issue. Uh, I think it's certainly the case um, that in the energy climate space there are tremendous opportunities. Uh, you know, for, uh, for cross-border uh, investment. Oh, uh, you know, we have a representative from the Standards Authority here in Australia. There are a whole host of standards-related issues um, with the charging of electric vehicles and so on and so forth. That, you know, working level but very substantive discussions that potentially could occur. Now, what, what those opportunities, opportunities are, where they look like, I think need some scoping, right, so you can identify those areas that will be like, most likely be fruitful. But in general terms, you know, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm bullish about that. Would you like to comment on Dr. Kugler on this subject at all? Oh, no. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll ask uh, one last question, and uh, that will have to be it. Thank you. Uh, Greg Chankin from Griffith University. I've got uh, a couple of questions. One for Professor Kirsten, which is essentially your idea of a log that the logical next stage. The logical next stage uh, from non-traditional to traditional security uh, is something that doesn't have a constituency in either domestic uh, situation in Australia or Japan. Um, and so, and in a sense, that was what was articulated uh, by Kubo, uh, Professor Kubo in relation to the reluctance to, for people to participate in traditional security matters. So I was wondering what, what you are thinking that might trigger that, and this has been talked about for some time. Um, and the other question I have is for Professor Kubo, which is in relation, kind of a bit outside the Australia-Japan relation, but it's to do with maritime security and that Japan has been trying to promote relations with Vietnam in the last few years uh, that it sees perhaps <coughs> better, greater security for when they're within the region, I'm saying within the particular regional area of the South China Sea, uh, and where do you think that is going to take Japan in its relationship with Vietnam in military issues? Okay. Thank you. Could Thank I you. just ask you to respond briefly? Thank you. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, the peoples of Japan and Australia are not clamouring uh, to upgrade the relationship in that way. This is a, a view that um, exists in the defence uh, bureaucracies um, in each country, and I would argue to a certain extent also in the, the foreign affairs constituencies. It's about uh, projecting, uh, it's about what is the path that we're on. And uh, it isn't a path that says we go this far and no further. It's a path that says, well, logically, we're going to have more space collaboration, we're going to have military exercises, and yes, ultimately, we're going to be in the field together at some point. So uh, defence export industry um, as a component of upgrading the relationship, it's a really tangible, uh, long-term um, element that would facilitate that trajectory. And so it's the policy makers who wanted it, not the people. Um, what will change it? Well, we might find out um, if a, an ICBM goes over another part of um, Japan in the near future or even lands somewhere in Japan, I think we'll see a change in the statistics that Professor Kubo showed us about how many people are willing to step up and, and um, defend Japan. I think it will transform uh, the atmosphere and I think uh, Prime Minister Abe, to a certain extent, um, is looking at this as a kind of an opportunity, <laughs> to put it very bluntly. Um, he's, he's in a bit of trouble domestically, and this is the kind of threat that will galvanise public opinion in the direction that he's hoping it will eventually go in. Professor Kuba. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for your excellent question. <coughs> About uh, the submarine, you know, uh, the uh, export ban of the weapons were loosened very recently, and uh, my guess is that uh, the government assumption was uh, for us to go very slowly, you know, gradually, uh, which is a typical Japanese thinking, with like uh, concluding uh, the 
the yeah. agreement with the UK uh, on selling boots and the uniforms, you know. <laughs> then the Australian government invite us for a submarine bid, which is a really a surprise. So, you know, we probably Japan was not really kind of trained, you know, and uh, accustomed to or, or you know, or skillful in selling uh, these things. But uh, there's a, if uh, there's a, another chance, you know, we'll do a, a probably a better job. Uh, about uh, the South China Sea, you know, of course, uh, for Japan, uh, the East China Sea uh, is more serious uh, threat and uh, uh, is given uh, more priority you know, in uh, national security uh, uh, <coughs> policy. Uh, but we tend to see uh, the South China pro uh, uh, the problem uh, with uh, that like in Crimea or in Ukraine in the sense that uh, the, these are the same cases of unilateral action by force, <coughs> unilateral attempt to change the status quo. So, you know, uh, we uh, have a very keen uh, interest uh, in what's happening in South China Sea, but uh, you know, our way uh, to uh, deal with this uh, is uh, uh, not by sending, uh, you know, uh, military vessels to that, uh, you know, region, uh, but uh, by, mostly by helping uh, Vietnamese or the Filipinos uh, 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 having uh, their own uh, you know, uh, capabilities to defend their own territories. And I think Japan is working with Australia uh, on these things too pretty closely. And uh, there's a proposal even in Japan for Japan to send a military vessel uh, to the uh, the waters claimed by China in South China Sea, but uh, then the reaction might be <coughs> fairly violent uh, from the Chinese side, and then you know have to be more alert on the East China Sea, which might be a burden for the U.S. military too. So I think there's a probably tacit understanding that Japan will mostly you know. Uh, concentrate, concentrate on uh, East China Sea in a narrowly military sense, but we help uh, these uh, the countries adjacent to, adjacent to uh, uh, South China Sea uh, in a very different way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of the uh, four speakers uh, for, as Peter Drysdale aptly put it, an extremely stimulating and very um, um, thought-provoking uh, set of uh, presentations. It's been an excellent session and I appreciate the audience participation as well. Please join me in uh, thanking the four panelists.